Thank you. Okay, so um, just, just to let you know, I'm recording this section and uh, welcome to everyone. I just, just a quick reminder, if you could, um, um, Subrata, do you mind muting um, um, your, your, your audio? Just I want everyone to make sure that their audio is muted. Um, and if you have a message, feel free to, um, um, you know, just type it in um, either to the group or to me, or just feel free to unmute yourself and ask, break, you know, interrupt, feel free to interrupt. I, I want to add a couple bits of information um, to about the course website. So I'm going to go to that. I'm going to share that screen with you guys. Um, let's see if we can go to that. Let's see. Um, let's go to my Google Chrome and we should be able to see that. Um, can you guys see Google Chrome? You should be able to see that. Good. Okay. Fantastic. So let's go to the course website, in Introduction to Quantitative Methods. Um, I just want to point everyone, just as a reminder, that we have a little website. If you go to the course website, type it in and go to pages and go to our tutorials. What we're doing for every week now is when we roll out our material, we're also, I'm also um, promoting and presenting material that is roughly going to cover some of the aspects of data analysis that we're doing in our studio for that coming week. Um, you'll see that we have some stuff in terms of uh, categorical data analysis. Um, and we should have something in numeric, um, numerical data analysis for this week as well. And those roughly capture a, you know, consider a considerable amount of what I discussed in section. What I'm hoping to cover in this hour, and, and those are broken into segments, so you know, shorter segments like 10, 15 minutes. What I hope to discuss with all of you is um, the numerical data analysis components, particularly as it pertains to the problem set uh, for numerical data analysis. And this mat roughly matches um, the lectures that we have. So that being said, I just want to emphasize that if you have questions, I'm going to try my best to um, answer those questions using these tutorials. And you know, just because I think if some, one person has an issue, everyone else does. As well, I think they're informative for reviewing the material. Some of this materials might be complex uh, for, for some of you. Um, I wanted to emphasize this as well, just and finally, just to emphasize the fact that um, there, you know, we can talk about course content, but I also want to talk about, um, I'm not sure if I'm sharing this. Does everyone see, by the way, the course website? Do you see that? No, you don't. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share that instead. Um, okay, thank you. I, I see I did it for a second, and now I, no, I don't. Okay. Thank you. So um, I should resume the share. Let's see if we have that. Okay, now you should see a screen of my, good, thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up, everyone. So, uh, my apologies for that little bit of a, uh, confusion. Let me make sure that I'm also recording this section. Um, good. Okay, we're we're good to go. We are recording. So the the section on numeric data, numerical data analysis. What I wanted to show you is if you just go to the course homepage and you go to pages. I'll take you to the course homepage. It should be roughly similar. Just go to that right left tab rather. Click on that, and you'll see some R tutorials. And these cover the material that you'll see each week. It'll open you to YouTube, and each R tutorial also has an accompanying PDF file, typically that simply covers the material as well as mentions a few functions. Um, it's probably more useful if I direct you to some external links. Now, um, and as you can see, here's some nice uh, tutorials that are done on categorical data analysis. You should see the numerical data analysis um, in the next page, actually. No, guess not. Okay. Well, those should be up. You should see tutorials on numerical data analysis that covers this material. Let's get started from the beginning. I think because we have data analysis um, difficulties, I want to navigate. Um, we're going to cover a few things. We're going to first. The first thing we're going to do is load our our popular kids data set into our in our studio. So this is assuming that we've already installed R, and it assumes that we've already installed the Mosaic package and basically have our interface set up. So I want to navigate starting from the home page. So let's go home. You know, when you log into the course website, this is how you're going to download the data set. 
uh, and it's exactly the same as you should have for the Titanic data set. Um, are there any questions? No? Okay. Just go to quizzes as you've done before, and then go to, um, if you see problem set two, that was what we had done earlier. Um, problem set, sorry, problem set one. Problem set two is where we go for numerical data. And you click preview or, or resume, and you just go to this section where it goes to describe um, this data set in a little bit more detail. Oh, sorry, it gives you the link. So here you have, it says under part two, data analysis in R. Open the data set, popular kids in R. So that's what we call a, a dot uh, R data file. And then here's the accompanying R code. And we're gonna review this in, I, in the today's section. I, again, to underscore, these are also available, the, reviewing this code and its variants will also be posted online under the R tutorials page. But we want to uh, um, save link as, uh, actually we should just, you should be able to single click. And I just downloaded into my um, down folder, um, sorry, in my downloads folder, you'll see popularkids.r data. That's in my downloads folder. I just clicked that once. And I'm gonna click uh, just once the R syntax. That's P problem set two, R code dot R. So you have a dot R file and a, and a dot R data file. Now the next thing I, I recommend that you do is um, basically take what you have in your downloads folder and open that in a, um, save those to a folder that you have that's, that is aptly titled, um, but we'll call it problem set two, P set two, um, you know, folder basically. P, um, P set two um, analysis. And I'm just typing right now that folder. You're going to see this in our studio. Um, so I'm going to, so what, what you should see is um, basically download, I've shown you how to download from the course website the R syntax or the R code as well as the popular kids data set. Now we're going to switch to R studio and we're going to open that data set and from our desk, uh, which to a folder that I saved to our desktop. So um, let me see if I can share the desktop with you as well. So um, actually, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll just, I'm going to share, um, I will just share our studio. Can you see our studio within the, within the environment as well or no? I guess not. Let me, let me share that with you. New share. Um, Come on. Let's see. We're going to switch to um, desktop one. And I just want to show what I have here. Uh, if you look at my desktop one, you should be able to see that I have a folder here called problem set two data analysis. Um, yeah, I'm going to share that screen. So here you have in that folder problem set two data analysis. And that screen itself has um, two files right here, an R data file, as well as, um, I'm just gonna move it off the screen, an R data file and an R script file. And I just saved those both from my downloads folder and that's what it should look like. And you can see I just downloaded those. What I wanna take us to is um, to our, to, into our studio. And you can see that on the screen here, I just have that open. Um, we're gonna open this, this R data file in this folder and we're gonna open the script as well and start a new R session. So let me, let me just share with you R Studio just so for simplicity's sake. Um, let's see, here we have R Studio, good. So now you should see within your screen R Studio. And um, within R Studio you should see the console and the plots in the environment. This is what typically when you start a new session. You might actually have last week's session. If that's the case, um, just close and save whatever you've had before, and it should look like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to open, open a file, and we're going to go to the desktop. Let me see if I can find this on the desktop. Um, you'll see you'll see that folder I had before, and we're going to open um, problem set two data analysis, and we're going to open the data file. And then ask, do you want to open this data file? I always ask you, and you just load it here. And we're also going to open, uh, open file. We're going to open the 
problem set two code. Okay, so after using the drop the drop down menu, you should have essentially what is the syntax in in one folder. You should have the the data frame loaded into what I whatever you want your working directory to be. I hear I'm using the desktop for simplicity's sake. This is what the data set should look like. You should have a data frame that has 478 observations and 10 variables. So with that, I just want to emphasize that um, that's what you should have. Now, as always, I emphasize that we should probably run the mosaic, and we should install the mosaic package each time we, we run an analysis, simply because we're starting out with R. And you know stuff may happen. So here I'm going to reinstall um, the 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 package. Hey Nate, can yes. I ask a question? You you made the comment, Don. You made the comment earlier that when you bring up our studio, you may have all of the things in it from your prior sessions. And you yeah. said you said just close and do something, but you said that very quickly. Yes. And I do that. It has all the old stuff in it when I go in and try to work. I don't know how to clear it out. Got it. Okay. So this is what, this is what you do. You have, um, so we'll save, the, we'll save this R session. Let me see if I can give you just a, a dummy R session, just sort of like, not a dummy, but like a, a fake one. Um, let's just file open a script and we're going to, you know, save this. Um, you know, I'm going to save this in that same folder as example of, from previous, and then we'll just, you know, I'm typing some gibberish here, and I'm gonna save this in my, um, you know, folder, and then we're, we're just gonna close, and it's gonna ask me to save to this, uh, this workspace image. So here I'm gonna save, and I'm gonna pretend like this was a previous um, session. So I'm gonna reopen our studio, um, Don, and, and, and I hope this will answer your question. And then I'll, I'm gonna reopen a session that I had before, and I want to basically start from square one. So let's reopen our studio, and I, you should see that open to your screen again. Um, let's see. We're gonna, I'm going to share that uh, our studio interface. So here we have that what we what I did before, which is basically the scripts, the data, but then there's this other thing that we had from a previous analysis. It's probably the Titanic data set. What we want to do is we want to say um, close all. And then from the data frame here, we want to put this little um, this little broom here and remove the objects within your environment. So again, we close everything, and then we sweep or clean our environment, including hidden objects. And then we save, um, and then we can quit. Actually, I don't think we'll have to save. I think we can just actually quit, and then it'll ask you to save, and you want to save. So then when you next open your next session, you'll see that you have basically, um, I'm gonna share with you what I had just basically done when I restarted our studio. Now you should see what I had before. So to answer your question, Don, simply close out everything you've done, make sure, making sure you save them, and then the, uh, the broom icon to clear the objects from the workspace. And that should keep, get you back to square one. Just as a quick reminder to everyone, make sure that you're entirely muted. I can hear a little bit of background noise. Uh, you should see a little uh, sort of red hash icon uh, over your screen, just, just to confirm. Okay, Don, does that answer your question? Is that a, is that a good thumbs up or, or do you have, is, is it, would you like more clarification there? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for, for what, forcing me to slow down here. Um, okay, so, Let's go to the, um, let's see, let, let's go to the syntax. So here we are back at square one, and we're gonna um, open, open our, our data file that we saved to our desktop, and we're gonna open the syntax file. So we're gonna open the popular kids data frame, and it'll ask each time you just click yes, and then we're gonna um, open file, we're gonna open the, the code, and this is the code that we had just downloaded. So here we are, and we're, we're gonna highlight everything until the line 14 for, for week two. And the reason we wanna do this is simply to confirm that our packages uh, have installed correctly. So let's run this and see what happens. 
Um, and you should be connected to the internet as usual. So you'll see this little icon here. Um, and then you see that it's installed successfully. Okay. And then if you wanna du double check to make sure that your package is, is installed, you can see from my user library, Mosaic is installed. But it's always useful just to type in Mosaic here. And you'll see that it looks like I have two versions of Mosaic actually installed. I'm not sure why that's the case. I'm gonna get rid of one of those. And I'm gonna reinstall. I actually don't know why that's the case. Um, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna restart R another time. Okay. So you'll see, um, it's always important, I think, to make sure you're starting off on, you know, sort of on a clean uh, footing, so to speak. So here we see the data frame loaded up. Let's see if we can get the, those library, the library called in as well. Okay. So it looks like I, I have two mosaic labels here. I'm gonna just double click that third one, just in case. I, you shouldn't run into any difficulty. Here I have some syntax to get to the working directory of your session. You can you know, use that or ignore it because what I've shown you is a way of uploading the, the, uh, the, the data file without having to use the scripts that I've included in, today, in this week's problem set. Um, I'm gonna skip down and I'm gonna take us to um, this first component. And this, this matches or mirrors the R tutorial, which is in three segments. First, we're gonna expand on this idea of exploring your data frame or data set in terms of rows. Next, we're gonna uh, review some of the, the quantitative uh, tabular uh, statistics for quantitative data analysis. Third, I'm going to show you a bit about the graphics uh, uh, graphical functions using mo the Mosaic um, um, interface. So I want to emphasize here that we're using Mosaic mostly in, in this course. So you want to make sure that that is uh, loaded and in your you know working um, environment as a as a user installed package. So what we had reviewed before is we talked about the, these two functions here. We talked about this view function, which lets you view your data set in or data frame in terms of an, what would be considered an Excel sheet, and we talked about these, the utility of these fil this filter. We had also talked about this names function, which will simply um, print out for you within the console uh, the names of the variables in the data frame, which is quite useful. And we can talk more about that, but you know, the nice thing about R is that you can um, always play around with these things. But these are two functions we've explored before. I'm gonna expand on that by talking about, uh, you know, exp expanding on what I had said earlier, which is this idea of a head function and a tail function. And I think this is relevant because imagine quite often in data analysis that you're asked to do some statistical consulting and you don't know necessarily all the attributes of a data frame. It's usually good to explore parts of it, especially if it's a very large data frame. It might be a little overwhelming or somewhat arbitrary to explore the data frame by looking at everything. So we're gonna actually close off that window. And I just wanna show again what we have here, which is to print within the R console, the first few rows of the data frame as if you uploaded it. So the point here is, if you wanna look at the head of the data frame, in other words, the first six rows, you can do that. And it does it by uh, variable name. And you can also look at the tail. And that's simply the tail function. So you can also type that in. So you just type head, and then you type in the name of the data set. Popular kids, make sure that the, what you capitalize is capitalized. And you have that again. Now I'm gonna clear the console, and you can do that um, here. And all this does is it's, it sort of wipes the slate clean. I like to do that. It's like, uh, it doesn't affect your analysis at all. In fact, if you look at your history, it already sh shows what I've done. So far, all, all clearing your console does is it sort of, it's like an Etch-a-Sketch if you know what, remember that toy. It's like shaking your screen just to clear the slate. I, I like to do, that, to do that every once in a while, simply to um, show, in, to show you what, what to work with. Because I think the next function is a little more complex, but it gives you this idea, of, which is a neat concept behind um, R. And the reason we promote R in this course is that, R is, a, is an object-oriented environment. 
In other words, you'd help def you define objects. You define what you want to play with in your little sandbox, in your global environment. That's what we call, I like to think of this as my little sandbox because here we have a data set, but we're going to do something with the sample function. The sample function will take your data set and then randomly sample that, a subset of that. And here we're going to set that size to 10 rows. In other words, if you just highlight this syntax on line 74 and you run this, you're going to define a new object, a popular kid's data frame, that is a random subsample of 10 rows. And it can be any 10 rows. And in fact, if I repeated this session, it might be a different set of rows because I'm randomly uh, examining a subset. So if you look at my tutorial that, I, that I'm going, going to post, you'll see a different subset of 10 rows. Now this is useful because sometimes the ordering of rows in your data frame matter. In other words, when someone created a data frame, perhaps there was a reason someone created the data frame in that particular order. And it's sometimes informative to look at just a random subsample. So I'm gonna um, run that syntax and you'll see that I just created a new object here. And that's a new data frame. Now we can view that new um, data frame, popular kids 10, and you'll, and you'll see there are 10 observations of 11 variables. Well, that's interesting. Let's, let's use our view function on that, on that data frame. If you see in the, in the syntax provided for the, the problems that you can look at, just simply look at the head, but I just want to repeat the view function and show that we can do this for the smaller data frame too. And we can also do the names function. And that's relevant because you'll see we have an, an additional variable. So let's do the names function. Names popular um, kids 10. RStudio is quite helpful. It's kind of like Python in that way. It'll help auto-complete some of this. But look at this. We have our, our original variables, but we have an 11th one called original ID. In other words, what, what the, the, the sampling function did for us is it gave us that subsample, but it also gave us some number that indexes our original row of the data set. Because in our new data set, we have, um, well, you'll see these numbers here, but it actually it's only one through 10. So if we manipulate or alter this data frame whatsoever, we'll still keep this little variable here if we want to merge or melt this data set after manipulating it. It's, in other words, this, this last variable, the reason we have another variable when we use the sample function and define a new data frame is that we're creating a new variable that tells us which row we originally used. Now, I want to emphasize this idea of an object-oriented environment. The reason this is an object-oriented environment is because here we have more, multiple data sets, actually, multiple objects. But the other point is, you can define something in terms of something else. And I, I elaborate this in the, in the tutorial. We don't have as much time today, but there's a, something that's really important and key in the R syntax language, which is uh, this idea of an assignment operator, which is this little thing that I highlighted here, this little arrow, which is just like a little uh, sort of a carrot going you know, to the left side of your screen by a um, followed by a hyphen. This is called the assignment operator. What it says is that um, thing being defined, so thing being defined is assigned um, what, whatever, well, what, what, whatever, <laughs> whatever it uh, is one. And that's something in R that we can always use. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Yes. I see that uh, popular kids 10 has been created from a random sample of popular kids. Yes. But how come it has 11 categorical variables, whereas popular kids has 10 categorical variables? Yes. So this is what I was trying to explain earlier. I will use the view function of the, of the original data frame. So we'll look at the original popular kids. What I wanted to show to you is, is this. Actually, you know what? This is an easier way. I'll clear the screen, and I want to show this to you. Could you um, provide your name? I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. Sanumala? Uh, this is Sruti. Oh, sorry. Oh, Sruti. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Sruti. So we'll use the names function for our original data set. And then we'll do, oh, sorry. My bad. 
what I want, long story short, is that, is that popular kids 10 has 11 variables because it, we include an additional variable that gives us the row identifier number. It gives us the number of the row from the original data set. So it tells us from what row did you sample the original, uh, this popular kids 10. So, and you can get this from the names function if you want to briefly compare um, data frames. So here are the names of the original, of the original sample, you have age, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through money. And then popular kids 10, back, um, you're going to see one additional variable name. This one right here. Okay. Right, so here you have the same variable names in the same order in the subsample. But in addition, you see that an ID number. That when you look at this, look, let's look at this last row. Here you see money, looks, sports, grades. You look at the subsample, it's exactly the same, except that you have the original ID, which is simply the row from which you grab that identifier. Or that, sorry, the row from which you grab that, um, that, that student's information. So, um, and we can look at that in a classic example, right? So let's look at row 210 in our original data frame. We'll just scroll all the way down. Here we have row 210, I'm sorry, two, 216, my bad. If you look at the first row of our subsample, it's 216. Here we have 216, there's 11 year old girl with grade level five from a uh, Ringe school, that's the name I suppose, in, in a rural location. Um, she specified her goal was grades, and then she ranked each of her, these attributes. We'll, we'll see that that corresponds to this girl right here, yeah. Ringe rural grades. And that's all that we did here. Any other questions about the sampling function? I think that's an important idea. I have one more question. Yes, Ruthie. Uh, so it is selecting the uh, 10, because we are creating a new data set with 10 samples, so it is selecting 10 samples randomly. How does it select, select those 10 samples? Is it using sampling algorithm internally? I, I think, uh, yes, what it does is it actually, uh, randomly subsets a uh, selection of rows. And if you want to know more about that, you can always do the help function, which I'll talk about. I'm going to have a tutorial actually, I'm working on that today, is, is a help function to actually get help about some of these questions. But to learn more about the sampling function, you can always type in question mark sample, and that will give you the, um, that, that'll give you, well, that's actually, that's a little bit different, but um, we'll do help sample here. Um, you'll get several options, but actually we want the okay. mosaic package. Um, here you have, essentially, um, I wouldn't get, I, I would say there are many sub arguments here. What I want to emphasize actually is that, to answer your questions, Ruthie, is that you can get help on, on get more information, but the intuition is simply that you're just randomly sampling this. You're using a random number generator to say, okay, here I'm going to randomly pick 10 observations. And so, the thing I want to emphasize here is that you were able to define this as a new data set within R. And that's, that new, that's a new data set to explore. And the reason it's relevant is that sometimes you want to get a snapshot that is entirely random as opposed to simply the first few or the last few rows. And I'll, let's look at that tail, for example. I'm going to take you back to the big data set and we're going to look at the tail function um, because I think it's important to, to emphasize or underscore the utility of a random subset. Look at these last six observations of the full data set. So here we're looking at all 478 kids in the sample of those 10 variables. Well, it doesn't look very random, does it? Because these last six rows are all 11-year-old boys. So sometimes it's useful just to get that random sample and to look at that. And what I want to emphasize and move toward um, is that Simply, I think the idea, and again, a lot of these concepts I, I review in the, in the tutorial I'm going to post online, but this intuition here is that, um, first of all, we can look at rows of, an, of a data set to explore it further, in addition to viewing it as an Excel file. Second, 
we're getting to uh, begin, we're going to begin our thinking about of data in terms of objects, things that we define as something else. So here we have a subsample defined as something else. And that's useful because we can look at subsamples and define it as something else. And I want to show you, for example, um, even in these two permutations, I just reran this code, you'll see these are two different subsamples because each time, if you name an object by the same name, it'll just override the previous one. But the point, I, I don't want to get too much into that, but you'll notice this, this little thing here, this thing called the assignment operator quite often. Just pay attention to that and think of it in terms of you're creating something new defined by something else. In this case, to translate it to uh, normal English, I'm taking, I'm going to define a data set called Popular Kids 10, which I'm assigning as a random sample of the larger data set, Popular Kids, this time with a random subsample of 10 rows. Ruthie, would you mind muting yourself? I can hear some um, background noise. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any other questions before we move on? Okay. Feel free to ask, feel free to answer. Uh, can I ask you something really quickly about the random sampling? Yes. So will it be the same every time, or will will the will we will it change? It will change, and that's what I was I was trying to show you right here. So let's take a look at this. Here I did the here I did the syntax for the random sample. I'm going to do it again. I just did it about four times, and you'll see that each time you're creating a new random subsample. Precisely because um, you're using a random function here. So here we have row 15, row 43, and row 15 are the top and the first and last. Here we have row 252 and 219, row 105, row 1319. If you want to have the same subsample each time, we can talk about that later. Um, it's a little bit beyond the, this, this course, but it's, a, it's a, called something, um, it's called setting the seed setting the random seed. In other words, it's sort of saying, when I roll the dice this way, I always want it to roll this way. I would say it's not that relevant for this course, but suffice it to say that when you're using the sampling function, beware that whenever you're playing with randomness, you're gonna get something randomly different. And that's what we want, that's what we're looking for. Um, does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Okay. Uh, and you know what, in fact, I'll, I'll even show this, and I, I can do this in a little tutorial as well, but I will use the set seed function, and I will provide um, the area code, the zip code for Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138, and I just want to show that you can actually do something called setting the random seed, and all this says is every time I do the random sample, it'll be the same thing, and I'll show what happens. So here first I'm going to set the random seed, and it's set, and then I define the object here, and then I'm going to look at that object. And you'll see that this should be the same when I rerun this code in contrast to earlier. Yep, and it seems, well, it doesn't seem to work. Okay, <laughs> why is that? Why, maybe I have to set the seed while I run this, we'll see. Well, I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure why. See, this is one of the, the, the idiosyncrasies of the Mosaic package, which is that it's, it's sort of a standalone suite of packages. So the sampling function that, that they use might actually specify the random seed apart from the analysis. Um, suffice it to say, typically when you run a random, anything that's random and you want it to replicate or, or repeat itself, you should do what is called setting a random seed, which simply says, I want my randomness to be, uh, be random the first time, and then every time thereafter to, uh, to stay the same. We often do this because a lot of statistics relies on some sort of underlying random algorithm. Nevertheless, um, the point for, for us right now is simply, we actually like this randomness because we get to explore different random you know, draws of the sample. Think of it as like you have 52 cards in a deck and you're gonna just randomly take 10 cards each time. You're gonna take a random 10 draw of that each time. You can do that again with a, a larger data set. So, we're almost halfway through the section, and I want us to get to the actual, I think, topical analysis this week, but I still think it's important that we focus on these things. So any questions about data exploration? Because I still think it's crucial that we understand what data, how to explore the data, and how to get an intuitive sense of it before we do to the, get to the analysis. 
is it, um, Nate, is it simple to comment on how it's different if the data is not in an R format? So I was playing yesterday and I, I saved some data from an Excel spreadsheet into a CSV file and then was trying to get it into a data frame so I could work with it. Yes. So, uh, Don, that's a great question. And it's something that is beyond the scope of this course. We can, I'm happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about this or perhaps even uh, get a little tutorial about this. We have made sure, so to answer your question is, yes, we can upload many different kinds of data files. So uh, to answer your question is, in particular, Don, you're talking about what is called a read.csv function. Um, and usually you would wanna do, um, you know, here's the file name. And then you want header to be true if you're, if, because your first uh, row will be, um, uh, the first row of your Excel sheet will be the, the, the variable names. And then you want, whether this is a comma or, or tab delimited file, you specify that within your quotation marks. And then um, that, I think that's all you really need to actually create the data frame. Um, and then, so you, you should just do that, basically. Um, if it's just spaces, then you should do that. If it's tab delimited, um, well, I'm not exactly sure, but you, you should, it should be some variant of that. Um, just make sure that you specify that the header is true because typically the data frame will, will include that. Um, get it in though. What's that? Once I get it in using this read CSV file, it's not yet assigned to anything for me to work on. Yes. So when you do that, you have to, def this goes back to defining it as a data frame as an object. So typically, if you use, if you deal with anything other than an R data file, so if you're dealing with anything that has like a .dat, .csv, or .dta, or uh, um, this, you know, I don't know, I think that's, a, that's an SPSS file or an Excel file, any other kind of data frame or that is not an R data file will require you to specify it typically as an object. Um, and that's simply because of, I guess, I'm, I'm not 100% sure why, it's, it's simply the way that R interprets um, other forms of data. Now what we did for this course is we made things quite simple for you guys, which is that almost everything is, a dot, is an R data frame, which means that it will load up in your global environment labeled as a data. What, Don, what you'll do if, if you, or anyone else who's interested in, in loading other kinds of data, typically it'll say, it'll label this under a different heading here as, a, as an R, as, sorry, as a data frame rather than data itself. So the point here is that anything labeled R, capital R, capital D, lowercase a, T, A, as an dot R data frame file is a, an R specific data frame. And it, it's only intended to open within the R environment. And we've made sure to make every data set um, openable in that, in, that, um, uh, in that manner. And now, of course, in the real world, you're dealing with all kinds of, da of data sets. You're dealing with things on your clipboard. You're, you're dealing with um, Excel files, things like that. Um, so that, this is a little bit beyond the scope of the class. But Don, I would, I, I would try this out, defining it as an object. And then you should see it named here as an object, similar to in the, in the same way that we created a subsample of kids as a random draw and define that as an object. You should be able to see that. So does that answer your question, I hope? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, that being said, we need not worry about these things. I'm gonna comment this out. And that, the hashtag or pound sign is, is how we comment things out. It should be green. Um, yeah, typically in this class, we're trying to you know, make focus on the concepts because there's a lot of material here. And if we go to this data set, I'm going to remove an object. And we have talked about this briefly, I think. Um, we sometimes want to remove our objects. We can do this or um, in, in the syntax line, and we're going to remove popular kids 10. And we're going to copy and paste this and remove our popular kids 25 data frame and they disappeared from our working environment. Now we're back to our same data frame that we had started with, our 478 kids and our 10 variables. Now, when reading the, um, the description and going through the lecture this week, you would know that this is a 
we're putting on the hat of a psychometrician. We're, we're now psychologists. Now, there's kind of a joke here, which is that all data are historical in the sense that these kids were probably sampled in some time in the past. Nevertheless, they were used to evaluate um, what, is pop, you know, what does it take to be popular uh, in school. And in the, our tutorial, I emphasized when, when exploring rows that if you don't know much about a data set, these can look like categorical variables, but they actually aren't. We know this from the course lecture, but also if you looked at the data, if you looked at some of these rows, you would see that kids are assigned only one value to each of these four attributes. Um, if we go back to the, the, the data set, we'll let's view this. We'll do the head of this. Um, just, just to give you a quick rundown on the data. Kids are asked about what's important to them, but then asked where the grades are important for being popular, sports, being good looking, or money. And most importantly, they're asked to rank these. And you can tell, get an intuitive sense that they're asked to rank what is important to being, for being popular, because they only have one of each value, each kid. So this gives us an, an intuitive sense that, well look, boy 11, boy, sorry, boy with, um, in row one, at age 11 in elementary school, has a goal of, of thinks sports is important. But when asked to be popular, he thinks grades are most important, followed by sports, followed by money, and least important to him is good looks. And we notice that, say, for this girl, um, she, when she's asked what is important, she ranks looks as most important for being popular, then sports, then money, and then finally grades to her are least important for being popular. And she has, she defines that as a goal. Now, of course, this is material covered elsewhere. I just wanted to emphasize that when looking at these rows, we get some information that we might not otherwise get if we didn't have any additional information other than the data set, because we can see, oh, look, these, these are not categorical data. These are not independent um, variables. They're actually, the students are forced to rank these. So it's a numerical these are numerical data. These are ranks in the same way that you could rank um, gold medalists, or sorry, medalists in a race. You know, you have a gold, a silver, and a bronze. Well, that's what kids are actually ranking here. They're, at, they're given four features of, of what it means to be a kid, and four attributes, and asked to rank what they believe is most important for being popular. So we're gonna look at, I think, what is the most important one, and this is aptly titled Fab Stats, the Fab Stats function which is, are the main numerical summary statistics that we want to deal with when, when we look at these data. And again, this is like a lot of other syntax. This is, if you look at my tutorial on arguments and functions, this is, a, this, is, this is where we can think about this function favorite statistics or fab stats as an expression, which is we want to know those favorite statistics for the variable grades, comma, using the data popular kids. And then we end that expression, that function, with a closed parenthesis. So the point here is that a very simple uh, you know, beginning point with any numerical data analysis is, let's get our favorite statistics that we have. What are the favorite ones? Well, here we have the measures of both central distribution as well as spread, right? We have the standard deviation, we have the maximum, we have the minimum, and we have the median, which is the 50th percentile, then we have, and we have the quartile one and quartile three. And we can get each of these uh, values separately for this variable as well. I'm gonna show, go through that quickly because I think it's pretty intuitive. But the main point is if you want those statistics all in one, you know, one area, use that favorite fab stats function. Otherwise, if you wanna do that, then there's the mean function and the median function. So we can get the median function. What does this mean? How to interpret this? Well, the mean is lower than the median. So this means that on average, the ranking that children gave to grades uh, as, as something important to being popular is not that high, in fact. And the, in fact, the 50th percentile is ranked around three. In other words, the most you know, about half of the kids, if you want to split the sample into one half and the other half based on its spread, the median is three. And this is an example of two different measures of central centrality. Now you can also use these same mean and median functions with uh, using the with 
command or the with function. All this does is this adds to the mean function, uh, it specifies the data set beforehand. And using so, so it's another way to really look at the mean. And this is, you can think of this as a, as a sentence. With the data set popular kids, I want to know the mean. So all we're doing is the mean function, and we don't specify the data set because we already did that when we said with popular kids. We're going to get the same output as we did it as we did with this. It's just another way to express um, the same function or the same syntax. And there's the median. So here we have two measures of centrality that we have from our favorite statistics. Here we have the variance and the square and the standard deviation. Now in lecture, I think Ethan did a very good job of explaining what's the difference between variance and, and standard deviation and, and why, why is it that we have to square these distances? We won't go into that now except just to say the VAR function gives us variance and the standard deviation is expressed as the SD function. And we know this, that the variance is a square root of standard deviation because we can actually test this using our syntax. Um, sorry about that, I added something here. So here's something called the square root function. But if I take the variance and I take the square root of the variance, then we're gonna come up with a standard deviation. And so we, here we see the standard deviation function in our console printed. And then here we see the square root of the variance uh, of, of the kids, which is exactly the same as the standard deviation. So that's just a, a quick example of, of the nesting uh, of, of functions that I had shown earlier and that we're seeing with even using the with function. Now we're gonna to go to measures of spread. I'm gonna move pretty quickly because I see that you know, we're going near the end of the hour. Um, here we have range, which is the uh, minimum and the maximum. This is one measure of spread. Well, this is pretty intuitive with grades because we know from exploring our data set that kids can only rank from one to four. And with th these many um, participants, they actually encompass the full range. You have some kids reporting grades as most important for being popular, some kids reporting it as least important. Now we have something called the interquartile range, which um, isn't that important, I think, in terms of um, syntax, but it is important in terms of concept. And I want to show this to you. Here we have it as, as a capital IQR function. Um, and you can see that the interquartile range is two. Well, what is that? Let's go back to fa our favorite statistics function. We're going to scroll back up and go look at this. The interquartile range is the difference between the first quartile or the 25th percentile and then our third quartile. So all it is in, in this example is four minus two. Well, that's two. So the interquartile range is an actual numeric value of the spread of the data. Think of it as like, a, I kind of often think of it as the median ver, uh, you know, version of, uh, of spread. Interquartile range you know, corresponds to the meat of two, is, is more robust to outliers in the same way median is more robust to outliers. Now, I wanna show this to you because I noticed that the function was in caps. Actually, it, it shouldn't matter whether or not this function is capitalized or not, because um, they're both in the mosaic plot function. Um, but let's, let's see what happens if we do it under caps. Yeah, see? So you can do it capitalized or not. Typically, when we write interquartile range, we usually uh, type it in as caps. Now the last measure of central distribution that we talk about is that value that occurs most often. This is how I remember this one. So we have mean, which is average, right? And then we have median, which is the 50th percentile. And that's what's in the middle, which is sometimes an average of, of the two middle values. Ethan elaborates on that. The last one is the mode. We don't often talk about that as often as I like in statistics. This is the most often value. I use, I type this out because I think this is how, this is how I remember the mode. It has a letter O here. The most often value in your data sets. What, what, what numerical value occurs most often? That's my mnemonic for memorizing what a mode is, even after all these years, because Mean doesn't include that, median does not include MO. But what is the most often value? Well, in this case, you actually have to nest your tally function as we did before. And we're gonna just count it up, count up our values of kids in each of the 
categories, you could say, of, the num of each numerical value. So here we created an object. So here's a value object, which is simply, we define as counts the tally of grades that is, constitutes the format of the count of kids with each rank using the data set popular kids. Let me say that one more time. We define as something new the tally of the variable grades, which is, in other words, expressed as an as a count using the data set popular kids. And then we're going to use the sort function of that object, which prints out those values sorted from least, um, you know, th those that uh, occur least often to those that occur most often. And this helps to answer the question, well, what is the mode? What about numerical value in terms of ranking occurs most often in the data set when we look at grades? And we see that most often kids are ranking three, a value of three for grades. Least often they're, they're actually ranking grades as the most important value. And so here we're using the tally function to define a new object and sorting that so we can get those values that occur most often. Uh, so here's some a little bit of background noise. Just a quick reminder to mute your um, to mute yourself if if you haven't done so already. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm anticipating about 15 more minutes, so we're going to go until about yeah about 15 more minutes. And again, this is this this is all this will be covered in uh, greater detail in, in 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 the tutorials that I post online. The first tutorial emphasizes or addresses. Um, the data exploration using rows. The second one looks at these statistics. The third one goes and looks at these graphical representations of data. And I think this is important. Uh, in particular, we start off with, um, well, first, before I show you any plots, I want to, I don't want to review the concepts as much as I want you to get familiar with this plot environment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run, um, these functions for large samples. And this is what we're going to start off first. We're going to create a several histograms. I'm just going to, you can do this with a, well, quite a bit of syntax. I'm just going to highlight lines 31, sorry, 132 to um, 143. And we're going to come up with one, two, three, four figures. And I'm going to hit run here. And those plots should be populating. But, um, my computer may be thinking. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So you'll see that there's a little bit of a space here. Okay, good. Now, I ran three, I cre actually created three plots at the same time. You can't really see that, but I wanna emphasize that here we have the plot window here. I've emphasized this before, but I'm gonna reiterate this. Make sure your plot window is relatively large because sometimes um, if the window is too small, it'll actually have difficulty rendering the graphic. Now what you have here, though, is if you run a little bit of syntax at the same time, you're actually running several plots at the same time. You can go to the previous plot or the, or the next plot using these arrows. If you hold your cursor, your mouse cursor, you can actually see the keyboard shortcut here. You can also zoom, and you can also save your plot as a different image or copy to your clipboard and then paste into a Word document, for example. This is, this is very useful, I'd say, when you're dealing with uh, or creating a new, um, uh, say, a, a project or a paper. Let's scroll back using the back arrow, and you'll see these measures of distribution. Well, these actually carried us through the first plot, the second plot, the third plot, and the fourth plot. I'm going to run the statistics, which are printed in the console. So the intuition is whenever we're run, creating graphics, they appear here. And they appear in the order in which we create them. And you can use the back and forward arrows to manipulate, um, the, to, to view those. And that the, the size of your window pane here for the plot function is important. The second point to emphasize is that your statistics are always printed out here in your R console. So here I did the favorite statistics um, um, uh, function, and I printed that in the R console. I, that, that just prints there. Well, let's click back our arrows and go to the first measure of um, distribution. Here, we're looking at the variable age. So we're not, no longer looking at grades within the data set. We're looking at this variable age, which is um, a numerical variable. Let's see if we can get 
Oh, there it is. There's the age. So I ran the statistics here just so we can, we can get an intuitive idea. On average, kids are about 10 and a half years old in this sample. They range from a minimum of seven to a maximum of 13. The median value is 11, which is slightly larger than the average. And the interquartile range as a measure of spread is 10 to 11, which suggests that, um, which is, you know, suggests a little bit of a difference from uh, if you compare the standard deviation and the mean. In fact, and oh, well, actually, before we go there, I just want to emphasize that you know, once we get a handle on, on the statistics, it's always useful to visualize what we're looking at. You want to see the data. And when we visualize numerical data, this is important. This is a key uh, idea in numerical data analysis. When we look at um, representations using the histogram function, or looking at histograms, or at density plots, or at what, we, what we call box and whiskers plots, that's the DW plot function. All of them are used to assess the overall distribution. They give you the bird's eye view of the data. And that's really important because you can have really precise numbers, but you might not get a good idea of what the data look like. And what the data look like also depend on decisions that you make. First, in our first function, we use the data set to define a, as a histogram um, a, a, distribution, a distribution graph or a histogram of age defining a splitting age into three bins. I emphasize this point because we don't get much information if we split our age into three bins. But let's look at this next function that I ran. And we're gonna look at that looking using the right arrow. If we define it with uh, age using five bins, which makes sense because you know, that roughly approximates to as many categories as, as we'd expect in the data, we see something much more valuable. We see the actual distribution, which corresponds with our numbers, right? We see that the median is 11. Most of these kids are around 10 or 11. Very, very few are seven, and very, very few are 13. These are the outliers. So what the relevant point here is that um, the number of bins that you use to, to define um, your distribution in a histogram is relevant. And you can do that using the n ints equals arguments. And that's just the second um, argument you have in the histogram function. And sometimes that requires looking at the data and playing around and exploring the data. Um, now, here you have something that is a density plot, which is a, assumes a continuous underlying distribution. Now you, hear, now you see something where maybe you have a little bit too much information for the data that we have at hand. Age is a continuous variable, but as we saw exploring the data sets, age is expressed as an integer in number of years. That means that these, these valleys here, these troughs in this continuous distribution are not really reflective of the underlying reality. In other words, there, it isn't the case that there are no kids that, have an, uh, that are 10 and a half, between 10 and 11 years old. It's simply that our data are not fine-grained enough to really express that. So using a density function here makes it seem as if age is a really jagged distribution when in fact we just don't have those values. We know intuitively, theoretically, that age is continuous, but these are expressed in years. So these valleys here don't really provide much information. And in fact, they may be misleading, but they do tell us in fact that our data are expressed in integers if you didn't know that already. Here we have the age nine with no kids, you know, between a, sorry, between, yeah, between nine and 10, here's 10, Here's age 11, and here's age 12. So these troughs are simply um, an attempt by the, by the density, by the computer to, to impose a continuous distribution function. Now, I'm gonna take you back to the histogram and emphasize this point. I think people are quite often confused about what exactly a, a histogram is. And they're most often confused by what this is on the, on the y-axis. So here we know age is a distribution. What is this y? What is this density function? The main point to emphasize is that the height of the bar is the relative distribution of that value. So it's not the absolute distribution. It does not tell us how many kids are in there or, 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 age, or between the ages of 10 and 11. It tells us what was the relative density, what is the relative distribution within our sample. 
of those kids. And that's important to keep in mind because if we think about statistics, almost all numbers are relative. You know, if you think about how tall someone is, um, whether or not we're using the metric system or um, you know, the, 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 the English system of, 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 of inches and, and, and uh, feet, or just of inches versus centimeters, that unit of analysis of, of age or of height, in, in the case that I'm giving, matters. And that numbers and distributions and the spread is also relative within the sample. So I just want to emphasize that don't get too you know, fixated on this density here. Just understand that it's the relative distribution and that there, we, have a, we have a density function that tries to estimate what is the relative density distribution of one value versus another. So it's not an absolute distribution. Does that, does that correspond to percentages, 40% or 60% density? Um, it can. I, I don't want to emphasize that because it, it, can, uh, emphasize, it can use that. But it, it quite often depends on the um, distribution function. That, in other words, we're, like a lot of these things, there is a, a more complex mathematical reality that we're using to, say, smooth out these numbers. Like this is a, you know, I'm not even, for this density function, there's typically a default that we could specify to even alter this, this function here. Same goes with a histogram. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily take it as percentages. That can sometimes be the case, um, I, but it, it typically adds up to one. So here we have 0 0.4, you know, 0 0.15. Um, here we see a different distribution function um, that, that doesn't necessarily add up to one. But um, does that answer your question, I hope? Yes, that's fine, thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, the point is that it, it's, you really want to compare the relative heights of each of these right here. If you really want to look at the data and get a more exact value, this is where you go to this box and whiskers plot, or what I often call the box plot. And that's what we created with the BW plot function. And this um, is defined in the box in terms of the interquartile range. And then splitting that interquartile range, if we have a more normal or sort of a balanced distribution, we would actually see a median that's within this, within this inter interquartile range. In fact, what we see with this little black dot is that the, our 30th percentile, sorry, our 75th percentile, as I'm highlighting down here in our syntax, is the same value as our median. So what this does is this prints our quartile one, our 25th percentile, our median value, which is more often between the, the two quartiles, and then the 75th percentile. And what are these whiskers? Typically they're defined as 1.5 times um, the interquartile, or sorry, typically they're defined as the half of the lowest quartile and half the halfway point of the upper quartile. I say typically because sometimes they're defined a little, a little bit differently. You can specify the, the dimensions of the whiskers if you want. The most telling attribute of, of a box and whiskers plot, I would say, is that it relies on it, these, uh, the, the, the interquartile range, so these quartiles and the medians, and notably, <clears throat> it is used to specify outliers. And quite often, it'll specify outliers in terms of single, ca single cases. And here we see outliers of in, in our range of seven and 13. And if you look at the data set itself, you'll actually see that this explains why in our histogram, we actually see one value here and one value here, and why you see so very few values at seven and 14 in our histogram. So the histogram gives us a different idea of the spread, but it won't identify those particular cases. So we can attach labels to these, we can have a more elaborate graph, and this quite often we use this to identify outliers. Um, so, and here we have an, another thing. Oh yeah, I, I, I wanna emphasize this in the last 10 minutes or so. This is, what I've reviewed for you are the three kinds of representing, ways of representing um, distributions or of, of numerical data using rather large data sets. Um, so we, here we have the histogram, we have the density plot for continuous uh, va values, and here we have the box and whiskers plot, which is used to um, relies on the interquartile range and can help us identify outliers. Now with smaller data sets, 
um, we can do something else. And this will take us back to the, um, our use of the sample function. I'm going to create a data set with 25 kids. And because if you recall, if you recall I had eliminated that. Um, and before we do that, I want to, um, well, we'll do that. I'll, I'll add a few more figures. And the two plots we're going to use are um, the stem function here. So, and here we're using the width, the width function. I want to show that this is a nested function. Um, so here's the stem function right here. And this is a stem and leaf plot. This is sort of like a visual analog to the, um, to the histogram or the, or the density plot, except that you can see the individual values. And if we counted those up, um, we can actually see the individual kids. Um, I see I did this with, with a sample of, with a 10 data set, which we could do, but I'm gonna retype it to, to uh, look at the stem plot for um, 25 kids. But well, what do we have here? You'll see that the stem plot that does two things. First of all, it's not within our plot console. Second of all, you'll see that it is expressed here within, uh, sorry, it's not, it's not in the plot pane. It is instead expressed or printed at, as individual values. And you can count these up. This should add up to 25. These are the number of actual values within the data set. These stacked zeros simply mean that there are one, two, three, four values of one in this data set. If we wanted to have more granular information or more precise information, it would provide information on the decimal points. And that's what this little um, um, pipe, uh, this little vertical bar is right here. So what this does is that um, if we wanna look at smaller data sets, we can actually use the stem and leaf plot to actually look at individual values and explore that. Or can you also use graphically what is the dot plot? And I'm gonna show that here. This again is like, uh, like the histogram, you can specify the number of bins. So here we have 25 kids, each dot represents an observation or a child. And here we have it with uh, 25 kids. Uh, sorry, here we have the same 25 kids with um, five, five bins as opposed to three. So the point I wanna emphasize is that when you look at these ladder functions, when you look at the stem and leaf plot, and it's called stem and leaf quite intuitively because the stem is the integer and you have these leaves right here that that whose height are, are proportional to the relative frequency. And it'll give you an idea of central distribution, of centrality of the distribution as well as, as the spread. And the take home point here is even when you have as few as 25 cases, there's still information in the data and that those data can tell us something. And I would say, you know, what some interesting examples would be, you know, if you even in large data sets, maybe you want to look at a subsample of the population. You want to explore the data. Uh, you want to examine the, those. Or maybe you want to see, um, you know, just a random subsample again, as we had looked at before, and look at that graphically. Or maybe you have a small data set. And we shouldn't really worry about small data sets because those contain some kind of information. Maybe it'll tell you that you don't have enough information to actually run an experiment or to make any conclusions that the data aren't, are not informative. Or maybe it'll tell you something. Regardless, you can figure out something when you look at smaller data sets, numerical data. So just to review, we've actually covered quite a bit of terrain. We actually started out downloading the data set from uh, the course websites. Then we explored rows in our data set using um, using the, the head and the tail function and then defining uh, objects in terms of random subsamples. Uh, second, we looked at the favorite statistics uh, for numerical data and we printed those on the screen. Third, we looked at graphs both for large um, values and distributions as well as for smaller values and distributions. And I walked you through essentially every part of the syntax relevant to this week um, regarding this data set. So are there, uh, and I, again to repeat, uh, all of these will be, all of this information will be available in this section as a video, as well as um, <clears throat> separate R tutorials for each of the components. Are there any questions as I end uh, this section this week that you have lingering? 
I have a quick question. Yes. And what's your name? I'm sorry. It's Siddiq Shah. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, so the counts that you defined as, um, as a format here, will it stay like this if you close out the R tutorial and open it again? Or do you have to define counts for a table every time? That's a great question. So this goes back to um, what is it that we're saving? When we save an R session, um, actually this, this kind of dovetails what, what Don had asked earlier, which is um, how do I get rid of my earlier session? Right. The answer to your question is whatever it is you have in your R session, let's, let's close this. Um, well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this. Whatever you have in your present working directory in your current R session, it'll save like a saved game if, as long as you close out and you click yes you want to save your current session. I recommend you always save your current session uh, and remove objects as needed. And you can see that to remove objects, you use these little brushes here. This will remove all of the objects in, your, in each pane. This will clear all plots. If you highlight this little um, red sign in the plot pane, you'll, you'll only remove the one that you're viewing. Sometimes you want to edit your plots. For instance, I wouldn't want to show this plot, so I'm going to remove this plot, and it'll ask me if I want to. Now, this is the first plot that I see. I can no longer see the plot that I just removed. So long story short, yes, everything you do is saved as long as you specify that to be the case. Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick question. It's not about the R, but it's something I've been wondering about. Yes. It's about the, uh, your, your TA, your teacher assistant. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So is... I think you are my TA, but I'm not, I'm not sure. So I want to check with you. Yeah. Okay. So you want, it's about confirmation of who is, uh, who is your TA. Um, yeah. So just to clarify, um, um, I will, I'm, I'm not exactly 100% certain about checking on your end. I know as a TA, I know who my students are. Uh, I believe you're one of my students. But that's not really relevant for either attending this section or attending office hours for this course. Uh, I encourage anyone to utilize the resources available to you in terms of attending um, section as well as uh, attending office hours that are relevant to your needs and watching the videos that are relevant to your needs. Um, because everyone in this course has to do with, uh, deals with R. And I've had more, quite a bit of experience using R Studio and R. So, I'm typically tasked with answering those questions. So um, I'm going to say TA, TA assignment is relevant only in, in as much as we're going to talk about grades in the final project. But in just in terms of um, sectioning, it shouldn't matter. But I think this piece is very specific. There is, part in my section. there is a button on the Canvas website, Nate, that says people. Yes. And if you click it, that's where it will tell you everyone's name is listed there. And you can look at your own name and see who your TA is. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I, I, I couldn't answer that question because I, I know who, who's in my section and I have a list of them. But um, there you go. There's the answer to, to figure out who your TA is. Uh, thank you. Can I ask one final question related to um, R? Of course. Um, I see that sometimes you do a lot of your typing of the code in the preset section and then sometimes in the console section and I don't know if that's interchangeable or is there is there a difference in why we're using one over the other? That's a wonderful question. If I'm typing within the R console, I'm actually doing something pedagogical and I would never, if, if I were working on my own project, I would never ever actually do anything. This is sort of a more, so here we have the names of, of each of these panes, right? So here we have the console pane. This is the R script pane, uh, and it's, it has a suffix dot R. Okay. So you're asking, why is it sometimes I highlight this and I would run this, say, for instance, as opposed to typing out the command sort, command, sort counts. Right, right. Right, so this, well, I misspelled. So here's a classic example. Why wouldn't I type it out? Well, because you're gonna be error prone. Um, the advantage of typing within the console is that it, it is interactive. The disadvantage is that it does not save what it is that you do. And I actually, when I, when I type code myself, I want you to, I would encourage you to use the R script as much as possible because it documents what you've typed out. Um, 
Okay, and, and then it, just use it to run it on the console and see what the results are. Exactly. Yeah. All I, right. Normally, I wouldn't do this except maybe I'm doing something where I don't really want to emphasize something in the script because, um, you know, here I added a little bit of commentary in the script that is not available to you. But typically, I would really encourage you just to get used to just typing whatever it is that you want, um, you know, and then running it within this, uh, you know, highlighting and then clicking the run uh, tab or arrow rather, or control enter as a keyboard shortcut. Okay, that makes sense. I will always encourage that because then you just, you save, you save up what you do. Um, that's a great question. Any other questions about R and, you know, getting, with, you know, downloading the data, working with R? Any, any complaints, any issues that you have about R? Um, can, I, can I make you a question? Yes. Sorry, I don't know if this is a topic that we cover in the future, but uh, I noticed so far the, the data we are obtaining is coming in these files that uh, is, uh, the extension is R data. Right. So if we are in the future trying to work with real data, I don't know, we are downloading in a CC, CSV file or SQL, uh, how we manage to use this data in R? Right, so uh, that's a great question. The reason, uh, so Don had asked this earlier in the section, Matthias, right? Yes. Uh, did, did you, did, were you able to, to be here for at the earlier part of the section? No, sorry, oh, I should show you. No worries, so I actually answered that question earlier and it's a relevant one. Um, oh, sorry. It, it underscores the, the need to actually perhaps even do a tutorial on just showing how to upload different kinds of data. To, okay. to, to repeat the, the question here, I'm going to highlight this little line 82 that I was oh, okay. answering this. There are many different data files, a .dat file, .csv, and Stata, which is a kind of statistical software package, you use a .dta. You, typically, we often have Excel files. The point is you want to define as a new object that CSV file, and you're going to use read.csv. Another function to look at is read.table. Um, but the relevant point here is because we covering, we're covering a lot of material for a lot of different students with many different backgrounds, we're actually saving everything as an R data file and providing that for you. I acknowledge, of course, we acknowledge that there are many different data files that you're going to upload, but we, we really want to get you moving toward, uh, you know, data analysis rather than getting stuck, which, is hap which happens all the time, I have to say, in R. You know, it, it, it takes a while to get used to uploading the data in R. Uh, long story short, yes, you can upload different kinds, but we're, for this course, we only ask that you upload or know, have knowledge of our data files for the purposes of the problem sets, precisely because there's a, a finite amount of time and we found this to be most useful for students. But I, Matthias, I'm happy to answer your question in particular for your project, if you have a particular file to open. Um, feel free to address that. But, okay. but check Thank out the you. read table function and the read.csv function read that table. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Check out, so I'm going to save this and we'll upload this to the course website. So feel free to review this section as well. Uh, as a reminder, we also have um, the R tutorials that we're uploading, which uh, are, are, I think, if are, are a little bit more compact and you can actually play them back on YouTube, which, which might be easier for you as well. So thank you very much. If you have any other questions, visit me during office hours. And my office hours are 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or feel free to email me or use a bulletin board. Or ask one of the other TAs. All right? OK. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot for um, attending the uh, section this week. And um, looking forward to uh, hearing it from you um, in the future. Thanks a lot. And feel free to keep the questions coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Hey, Nate. Yeah. You said you could keep the questions coming. So I was playing oh, with last night, trying to um, read in some data that I assembled. Yeah. And one of the variables is a time duration in minutes and seconds. Can R deal with... Uh, a, a variable that contains a series of time durations, or will I have to convert them somehow? Yes. So um, here's time is 
is one of those vexing things, Don, in terms of in terms of reading these data in. It, I, the short answer is it sort of depends on the structure of the variables themselves. Um, quite often, it's difficult to standardize time, and and it's difficult for the computer to know whether or not you're specifying the month, the day, or the year, or whether the years in two two integers are like 16, 17, as opposed to 2016, 2017. But you're saying, if, I think what, what would be best actually, Don, could you give me a snapshot of the, um, the tail or the head of the data, or have you had difficulty loading it first? Well, I can get it into R, it seems. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I was looking at, um, I, I injured my leg earlier in the year, and I was trying to look at, um, my running times, I have a running log that keeps all my times. And so I loaded it all in and I was gonna to try to see if I could tell, um, one, where the injury occurred and two, whether there's been any progress made over time. And so I have a data set that includes, the, the first column is the date, the second column is simply an integer representing the number of miles, and then the third column is the average pace, minutes, colon, seconds okay and i was going to try to graph that over time but i was having trouble getting it to work with the data yeah so date functions are a little bit different i mean a little complicated in our um the, I, I would have to look at the data i think to see how you, um, your version of our studio is reading it in it could read it in as a string as a string variable in other words it's just simple text um but you should be able to specify date functions to actually, if it is a string variable, to parse that string into um, yeah. numerical values. Okay. And that, right. might, that might require some co complex functions that are, I say complex because it's just simply not, it's sort of, it's what you have to do to get the data, in, uh, yeah. right, which is uh, if the date, for instance, is, um, you know, number, well, what, how, what are the, do you know how the dates are expressed, Don? The is simply expressed as a uh, two digit for the month, two digit for the day, and two digit for the year with slashes in between. Okay. So it's month, day, year. Okay. So what what a lot of these computer programs won't know is simply the fact that are you specifying month first or year first or day first, right? So typically there's a date function um, to read in read in those types of data, um, but that's sorry, to, to apply to those types of, of date variables after you read it in, so that way you can apply it. Okay. Designate that variable one or column one is a date, and then it will recognize it as such? Um, I, I, well, yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer like ready-made for you simply because yeah. um, they're, they're, the point is that there are many different ways to specify this. I, this is how we, ideally done, I, I would say, this is how I'd want the data to be. I would want this to be a numerical value that is the number of, um, you said it's, it's, it goes by day. Yeah, so it would be the number of days since some arbitrary starting point. It's typically how we you know, standardize our date points. So like um, SPSS, a common statistical package, I think uses the Georgian calendar or something like that. Stata, which is common among econometricians, will say, the number of days elapsed since 1970, J January 1st, 1970. The point is you have an arbitrary starting point, yep. and then you have the number of, here we have number of days elapsed. And that's, yep. that's the way of standardizing your dates. So because then, then it goes back to the, the point I was making in, in, the, in today's section, which is you, we don't really care how many days since 1970, uh, June 1st, 1970, we're looking at. We're looking at the relative distribution of, of of that date, right? Okay. So you want to know over the span of a month what happens, or on Mondays, is it more likely that X happens as opposed to Tuesdays? Yep. Right? So there are a lot of really interesting questions that have to do with the date function that um, I think we can talk about later, but that, that are pretty much be, that are actually really beyond the scope of this course. Yeah. Um, are you thinking of using that in your in your um, as your as your final project? Because that sounds really interesting. No, I I wondered about that. I saw the assignment and I wondered, but then I, I don't want to make more complexity. Yeah. <laughs> but I am interested in looking at things like, um, you know, how does the, the, the performance change when it's the fourth consecutive day of running or yes. the third 
consecutive day or with one day off or two days off, I could do some very interesting analysis of the data um, for me. And I don't know whether that would be a good uh, subject of the final project or not, but. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's useful, but I think the, the issue that I have, the issue that I would have if I were taking on the project is simply, you're gonna spend a lot of time managing the data, which is extremely relevant and important. Data manipulation is 90% of st applied statistics, in fact. We're taking you through, you through the math and the concepts and then leaving out the 90% the of data management, data manipulation. So you'll have kind of an uphill battle, pun intended actually, running wise. Yeah. On, on the other hand, I actually think that's extremely useful. So if you really are interested in you know, doing more data analysis and data management, um, I would encourage you to, to, to go down that path. I would just say, um, I personally, you know, when I'm, when I've had to deal with date functions in the past, I've never really enjoyed it until I had the data at hand cleaned, right? I like the clean data myself. Getting there is, is a little more difficult. Um, but, but I'm happy to help you. And I was actually just, as we're talking, Don, I was Googling some, you know, what other people do in terms of um, data functions. There's a great book called um, Data Manipulation Using R, I believe is what it's called. Um, and that will, yeah, with R, data manipulation with R, um, by a guy named Phil Spector, not, not the uh, producer. Um, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text that to you. Actually, I'll text that to the class. This is a good book that I use uh, personally in terms of data manipulation, and it'll address any questions that you have regarding. Um, that's, a, that's a good suggestion you have. I think if I add a column, and I simply take the first measurement as day one or day zero, and then I just sequentially number each one in terms of number of days from day zero, it will allow me to not lose the sense of being able to look at winter, summer, you know, seasons, um, but I can, I can look at it over time that way a lot easier. Absolutely. Um, I, I do think there, uh, there are built-in functions in R that I haven't used recently. That might that might ex, that might make this a little bit easier for you. Uh, in terms of your data set, how large, how many rows do you have it in, in your data set? Uh, it, it's only about 150 rows. Okay, you're good, good. That's good to good. That's good to know. Um, so this is something where you could actually probably edit within using the view function or just within Excel before you yeah. import the data. Um, yeah. We able, just uh, out, of, uh, out of curiosity, were you able to import the data using the read.csv? function I gave or have you tried that? I, I imported it using, I think it was the load function. Okay. And um, actually I may have used the drop downs. Good. And then I was trying to assign it to a data frame so that I could uh, manipulate it and graph it. And that's where I got into struggles as trying to graph it over time. And I think it comes back to this. It's not recognizing the variables for what they are. Okay. Okay. Well, that seems like a, like a project specific question. I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, um, I'm just saying as I try to get more um, familiar with R. Oh, absolutely. And I think you're doing the best approach for that. Um, the other thing, of course, is to use the built-in data sets. Um, yeah. You know, that data manipulation with R book is very useful that I provided because that includes code as well as um, it relies on some of these data sets. I would be entirely shocked if it doesn't include um, anything having to do with dates. Um, yeah, of course it has dates. Um, yeah. Because that's just why, it's one of the, it's like the bugbear for data management is, is how to specify the date. Because more often than not, imagine like you're in a fortunate position because you know what the data say. Imagine we have two integers, two integers, and two integers, and I don't know which is the month and which is the day, or yeah. whether it's the, those are even accurately reported. Um, so one way to look at uh, your data frame, Don, actually, well, this goes beyond the class, but I think rel it's relevant to um, as long as you can get your data frame in as the object as I defined it, then you can actually look at, I'm, I'll share my, uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and I'll show you within our studio. Um, let's see if I can import a data frame here. Um, 
you, yeah, you, you see my screen. So let's see if I can define, first of all, as an object, one of these popular kids' data sets. Um, I will avoid the bad habit of typing within the console. And I'll t define as data frame, popular kids, um, kids 25. And let's see if that comes in. Okay. So it just, it's another data frame. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, okay, good. So, um, yeah, I want to, I want to do, I want to do something. I'm doing a little bit uh, of, of, of weird stuff here, Don. I just want to see if I can do something here that, um, yeah, okay. So, Don, one thing to do when you import your data frame, do you see me typing here using this? Yeah. Okay. Is, um, oh, interesting. Um, you should be able to use a class function for your values within your data frame. What I'm not seeing here is, um, let's see if this works. Okay, so this is, this is, we're on to something. Okay, so actually, as long as you import your data frame correctly, Don, if you notice, I did this class function. This will tell you what kind of class the object is, which is to say, what kind of object, what kind of variable is it when we talk about variables? Or when we talk about data frames, what kind of data frame is it? Or, or what, what is, what are we looking at? And I want to show that we can do this to data frames. So we do class DF. I created a new data frame, which is a copy of your popular kids data set 25. Then I did something else, which is I said, what is the class of the variable age within the data frame DF? So this, this dollar bill sign is quite common, which is to say within that data set titled DF, what is that class? And what I invite you to do is when you look at the date um, variable, Don, I would check out that class to see what kind of object it is. If it's a numeric, and that will help you determine whether or not, um, whether or not it's, it, your data are being read in as, as numeric variables or as string variables. Is that, yeah. Am I being clear there a little bit? I am, I'm, I'll have to figure out then whether I can reassign it or whether I have to break it apart. But I understand what you're talking about. It'll tell me what it thinks that data element is. Exactly. We want to know, um, you know, what you're, when you're reading in the data, the first thing to figure out for you is um, what's the, what, what category is it reading it in, in that variable, since you're already able to, to deal with it. Um, yep. And to, to contrast, we see that um, reading in the data frame for the popular kids data set, we can see that age is numeric, which is important, but school is a factor variable, and otherwise known as a string variable. A factor variable, if you recall, is a, just like a categorical uh, variable. Yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, that, that's relevant to, to look at. Let's, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, so we can talk more, Don, but I'm, I encourage you to look at that and, and figure that out. I think there's some okay. other questions, but. Gives me something to play with. Exactly. Good. Onward and upward. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Can I add, add something to this? Yes. Uh, so this uh, class variable, the, the the type of variable you have in each uh, column, is this coming automatically? Can you force like a column to be a day? Can you force it to be a string? Yes. 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 So um, so you would do this uh, like. Quite often, I think you would most want to apply this, Matthias, when you're reading in a data frame. I would yeah. assume that you, know, you typically type in, um, let's see if I can type in, I'll define as a new variable. Um, we lost your screen, Nate. Oh, yeah. you, don't, you don't see my, you don't see my uh, screen? No, it, it, it lost it just a minute ago. There it is. Okay, thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so, um, so you should do the as, so we should do like data frame. Um, oh, so here we'll do this. S we'll do school num, I guess, and we'll see if this is uh, as numeric. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it will take my school variable within this data frame, right? So here I define the data frame, which is the name of the data frame here, 
followed by the pound sign, which is the name of the variable. And of course, we know that the class of the school variable is a factor variable, right? And then we're going to define, we're going to read in uh, as our values, and this will be in the lower right hand corner. Um, we should see a new vector or sort of a, 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 a row of items as a numeric variable. I'm not sure what that really means in terms of logic, but you can see that you have re, re, um, redefined that, that, new, that new variable. Um, and you can see, or that new object rather. So you can see that that new object is now, should be as a factor or just sort of numeric. So in some cases you're misapplying it. Um, now you probably want to keep it within the data frame. So let's redefine this. I think you can do this. Um, and then we should do um, view, view df, and then we should have see that variable school num in there. Whoops. Let's see if we see that thing there. Yep, okay. So what I've done is I've added as a column within the data set, this one here, a variable that is now, that used to be string, but is now the numeric version. Um, and I'm not sure what that would mean except, um, wait, wait, sorry, that's a popular kids data frame. Um, yeah, that's a school number, so um, there you go. So you can look at like as numeric as factor. Quite often you're, you know, re, you're, you can read in something as a factor. So within this data frame, um, you say school, let's say we'll, we'll, we'll recreate age as a factor, as well, age factor, then this will be as factor. And it'll typically give you help here. And then the data frame school, and then um, and then we'll we probably shouldn't see it here. No, it, okay, it adds it automatically. I actually didn't know this, so this is kind of neat. So it, here we have age as a factor. It doesn't look like it when we view it, but we should actually I, verify this when we do the class function. Class uh, actually we do class here. And it's identified as a factor. So, Matthias, does that answer your question? I hope yes, so. perfectly. Okay. Thank now, you. I want to point out one little thing, guys, which is that, or guys and girls, or gals rather, which is that when we're moving away from the R data, R data frame interface and we're dealing with these other kinds of data frames as objects, you'll see almost ubiquitously the data frame defined with the pound sign. It's usually data, data frame, pound sign, column, column identifier. You mean a dollar sign? Yeah, that's the dollar sign that, ident that, that specifies um, what column of the data frame we're specifying. So here I'm defining as a new column in the data frame, a numeric, the numeric values, of the, sorry, the, the numeric version of the school variable. And it just adds that in addition as the final column within that data frame. But you'll just see in most syntax, in day-to-day -day operations, you'll probably see this pound sign here. Um, and that's just important to just to note that the interface might look a little bit different. But um, that, that, I think, if you look at, interact with the class objects, Don, that'll help you, and Matthias, that, I think that, that hopefully answers your question. And then you see, as, as I work through this, I'll define more objects. I already created this little object, I probably want to move, but any other questions? No, it's good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. That's a really good question. I have to say, I have to emphasize this is more than what's in the course, but you know, there's always more R to learn than what we can provide in the course. There's can't do everything. Okay. Yeah. And not everyone can learn everything, I have to say. Okay. Any other questions? No. no. Okay. Fantastic, yeah. everyone. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye all.